From the corner of 16th and Peachtree Street, right next to the High Museum of Art in Midtown Atlanta, welcome to the First Presbyterian Church. I'm Senior Pastor Tony Sundermeyer, and I want to thank you for tuning in to today's broadcast. And I would invite you now to join us in the worship of God. Good morning. My name is Mary Claire Alvine, and I am currently serving on session here at First Pres. Please join me in the call to worship. In that day, you will say, I will praise you, O Lord. Although you are angry with me, your anger has turned away, and you have comforted me. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord, is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. With joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. In that day, you will say, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known among the nations what he has done, and proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing to the Lord, for he has done glorious things. Let this be known to all the world. Shout out loud and sing for joy, people of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel among you. Please turn with me into your pew Bibles to Psalm 150, which can be found on page 551 in the Old Testament. Hear the word of the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty firmament. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his surpassing greatness. Praise him with a triumphant sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with clanging cymbals. Praise, praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that breathes praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second scripture reading comes from Acts chapter 5, verses 27 through 32. When they had brought them, they had them stand before the council. The high priest questioned them, saying, We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you are determined to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the apostles answer, we must obey God rather than any human authority. The God of our ancestors raised up Jesus, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior that he might give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. This, too, is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let us pray. Lord, break open this word afresh to us this day so that we might be different people than those who came into this sacred space this morning even to be more like your son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray, amen. With the head of a woman and the body of a bird, the siren of Greek mythology was at once an astoundingly beautiful and yet exceptionally dangerous creature capable of producing music so enthralling and so enticing that any sailor with an earshot of the siren's song would immediately be compelled to change their ship's course and head for the siren's island. As the ship would approach, however, uh, it would crash against the jagged rocks just offshore of the island, guaranteeing the ship's sinking and the death of its crew. 
There are many strands of Greek mythology that talk about sirens. One strand has the great poet and musician Orpheus traveling at sea on a ship called the Argo with Jason and the Argonauts. It was said of Orpheus that his music was so beautiful and so powerful that it could even make rocks and trees dance. As the Argo came into range of the Sirens Island, their music started to lure the captain and the crew toward it. Orpheus knew that if they followed the Sirens' song, it would lead to their death, and so he picked up his lyre, he began to play, and he began to sing such a beautiful song that was so clear and so mesmerizing that the captain and the crew of this great ship could no longer hear the siren's song. They could only hear Orpheus's songs and they focused on them and safely made their way toward home. Uh, leadership guru Peter Drucker once said that a leader is the trumpet that sounds a clear sound of the organization's goals. A leader is the trumpet that sounds a clear sound of the organization's goals. Like Orpheus, one of the tasks of a leader is to, metaphorically speaking, make music that keeps the ship on course. To make music that, that keeps the ship on course in a world filled with siren songs that can get us off track, that can cause us to wander and move in the wrong or even a dangerous or even deadly direction. Leadership is essential for any company, any organization, any church, any family who wants to stay focused on their goals, on their values, on their vision of who they're called to be and what exactly it is they are called to do. A name I've mentioned from this pulpit before is the one that belongs to the German pastor, Paul Schneider. Schneider holds the tragic distinction of being the first Protestant minister martyred in a Nazi concentration camp. On October 3rd, 1937, this is after Schneider had joined the Confessing Church movement. Many of you know this movement in history, in church history, a movement of Christians that were pressing hard against German Christians and the German church's allegiance with Adolf Hitler. After Schneider had already joined uh, that movement, and this was after he had already publicly spoken against Hitler and Nazism. This was already after that he went at great lengths, went to great lengths to excommunicate members of his church. Could you imagine that in this political season? Excommunicate members of his church if they align themselves with Nazism. So was after all of that, the pastor climbed his pulpit in the tiny village he was serving and preached what he didn't know then, his last sermon. In that sermon, he, he preached and called for the repentance of the nation. He called for an end to Nazism. After he had finished, he, he had another preaching obligation that night at another church, and so he got into uh, his car and he began to make his way toward this other church when police lights and a blockade impeded his way and he was arrested and imprisoned in the camp at Buchenwald near Weimar. It was said of the pastor that when the morning roll call was taken and the multitude of imprisoned Jews would gather in the plots, their dehumanization and humiliation taking center stage in that gravel area that Pastor Schneider would climb his bunk, he'd put his face against the bars of that tiny window and he would declare God's love for each of them. He would still preach even though he didn't have a proper pulpit. Every day he tried to drown out the siren songs of the SS with songs of the spirit that spoke light into darkness, hope in the midst of hopelessness. He even sought to evangelize the Gestapo and called them to reject their sin and to turn toward God. Friends, I think Paul Schneider was a leader. I think Paul Schneider was a leader. He was a trumpet for the goals and the visions 
and the values of the kingdom of God. I'm certain that he knew the words from the Barman Declaration. That declaration is the core conviction of the Confessing Church, church movement penned in 1934. In fact, it's, it's one of the confessions in the Presbyterian Church USA today. Part of that confession reads like this. Jesus Christ, as he has attested for us in Holy Scriptures, is the one word of God which we have to hear and which we have to trust and have to obey in life and in death. We reject the false doctrine as though the church could and would have to acknowledge as a source of its proclamation, apart from and besides this one word of God called Jesus, that it have to acknowledge still other events, other powers, figures, and truths as God's revelation. Now, obviously, Pastor Schneider was not the first or the last leader to preference the voice of Jesus, the song of Jesus, above all other voices, above all other songs, even at the risk of his own life. Acts 5, 27 to 32 is a snippet from a larger story about a group of leaders, Peter and the apostles, to be specific, leaders who essentially did the same thing. We pick up the story with these apostles arrested by the temple police and brought before the chief priests on charges that they refused to stop teaching in the name of Jesus. See, they were going throughout Jerusalem teaching in Jesus' names. They were bearing witness to Jesus and what God had done in and through him. The word apostle means ones that are sent, these men and women were sent as witnesses to the gospel, and at the core of their witness was an unwavering commitment to Jesus Christ as their true north. An unwavering commitment that Jesus was their moral and ethical compass, that Jesus was the chief desire of their worship, and he was the one to which their lives must conform. Peter says it this way, We must obey God rather than any human authority. The God of our ancestors raised up Jesus, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader. We'll come back to that in a second. As leader and savior that he might give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. You see, Jesus was the song they had to listen to. Jesus was the music they had to preference above all others, for his music would keep them on course and in line with the will of God as it is on earth, even as it is in heaven. One of the interesting nuances in this text is the choice of words that Luke, who is the writer of Acts, uh, has Peter employ to describe the identity of Jesus. Now, Christians confess Jesus to be Lord. We've heard that before. We've said that before. If you're a member of the church, you have said that. Christians confess Jesus to be Savior. If you're a member of the church, you have said that. But rarely do we hear Christians, either in a liturgical or theological setting, confess Jesus as leader. We don't hear that. We might say Jesus is Lord of my life, Jesus is Lord of creation, he's Lord of all. We might say Jesus is Savior of my life or or Savior of all humankind. But do we ever say that Jesus is my leader? It seems awkward, doesn't it? Jesus is my leader. To continue on the arc this sermon has taken, to say Jesus is leader is to say that he is the trumpet that sounds a clear sound of God's mission and kingdom goals. To say Jesus is leader is to say that we listen to his song and his voice over and above the siren songs that would take us off course. To say Jesus is leader is to say that he is the first cause and the author of our faith. To say Jesus is leader is to say that we're committed to knowing his word and committed to staying connected to his body on earth, which is in fact the church. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Savior. But is Jesus leader of your life? Is Jesus leader of your life? Was the current senior pastor, my commitment 
uh, remain strong. I want to steward this pulpit. I want to steward this call. I want to steward this ministry post in such a way that leaves no doubt that Jesus Christ is the leader of this congregation. That Jesus Christ is the leader of this church. It is his voice, his song, and his mission that we must hear, to which we must align and attend in our faith and our life together. As we began 2016, this session charged me and our executive pastor, Rebecca Lamont, and 10 members of this congregation uh, to engage in a long-range strategic planning process. We're just seven years away from our 175th anniversary. Some of you think, wasn't our 150th just a couple years ago? Seven years away from our 175th anniversary. And in light of that, this team has been charged with producing a vision and direction for the future, living into this new season, next season of ministry together, to focus and align our different areas of ministry, to clarify the criteria by which we will make decisions going forward, and unify our congregation around a common purpose and shared goals. Now, as you know, this is no small task and will require not just this team's imagination, energy, intelligence, and love, but will also require the same from the members and friends of this congregation. It will require something from all of us. Several years ago, I was leading a graveside service. It was in Philadelphia. It was the middle of August, and the humidity and heat index made it feel like 100 degrees. Now, the deceased was a retired serviceman. He was in the Navy. And there was a, a small uh, military detail in attendance as well to pay respect and to show honor for his service. Now, I was facing the family. It was a small group. We were, again, we were outside trying to keep it as brief as I possibly could in the sweltering heat. The family was like you, facing me. Behind the family were two of this, uh, two of this military detail. And, and they were standing at attention. And then behind me was the casket and the third member of the detail who had a bugle in her hand. Now, the events that transpired on that day, I will not too soon forget. First, the look of sheer panic on the family members' faces and on the two members of the military detail who were behind the family. I'll never forget their face of panic. Second, I'll never forget the sound of a body and some metallic object hitting the earth with great force. And third, I'll never forget when I turned around to see that that third person in the military detail had passed out because of the heat and that the bugle rolled to the ground and began to play taps by itself. Apparently, not every military detail has someone in it that can play trumpet or bugle. So they have an instrument that looks like a bugle, but has a device inside of it with speakers that the person will just hold it up to their lips and press a button and it will play taps perfectly, as I found out. Somehow, when the instrument fell out of her hand and hit the ground, the impact pressed the go button and began to play the song at a very inappropriate time in the service. I close with this. As we continue in this season discerning what it means for us to acknowledge Jesus as leader of our church, as we continue in this season acknowledging that we have to listen to his song so that we may be on course with God's will, there is a temptation to treat our participation in the playing of this song like that automated trumpet. Someone else has already programmed it. Somebody else has already come up with the tune, come up with the notes. I don't need to learn to play it. I just need to know when to press the button. 
and everything will be okay. But friends, this next season of ministry will require all of us to pick up the bugle and learn to play the songs of the Spirit. All of us. All of us. This next season of ministry will require all of us to learn the notes, to learn the tune, and to find our place in the orchestra of proclamation that Jesus Christ is Lord, Savior, and leader of the First Presbyterian Church of Atlanta. In about three weeks, we'll be launching a congregation-wide survey. Now, this survey will be very different than we've asked of the congregation before. This survey is deeply rooted in our concern as a long-range planning team with our call to produce disciples of Jesus Christ. That's why the church exists, to produce individuals who seek to make Jesus Lord, Savior, and leader of their life. And so we'll ask four questions. Why have you continued to make First Presbyterian Church of Atlanta your church home? What has kept you here? What about this community has compelled you to continue to participate in faith and life together? Question two, how might the church equip you to grow in your Christian faith and commitment in making Jesus Lord, Savior, and leader of your life over the next five years? How can the church equip you and encourage you in your discipleship? The third question, how might the church equip your children, teenagers, college students, grandchildren to grow in their Christian faith and commitment in making Jesus Lord, Savior, and leader of their lives over the next five years. And finally, how might you, we call this the Kennedy question, how might you, how might you equip other members and friends of First Presbyterian Church to grow in their Christian faith and commitment in making Jesus Lord, Savior, and leader of their life over the next five years? encourage everyone to participate in this survey. In addition to that survey, we'll be facilitating three town hall style meetings to present the work of this team thus far on May 22nd, June 5th, and June 26th following the 1045 service. And you'll see more about that in email and chimes form. When the long range strategic planning team met for the first time back in February, we had a conversation about what would be essential in this particular work. In other words, what do we have to always keep in front of us? What do we always have to remember about the work to which we have been called? What do we have to consistently and constantly remind ourselves of if we're gonna be faithful to God, faithful to the congregation, and faithful to the task to which we've been charged? At one point in that conversation, one of our team members, in what I would describe bold humility, said this, the most important question we can ask in this process is, who is God calling us to be and what is God calling us to do? This whole endeavor, he said, is about what God wants. It's about what God wants. We all agreed. Because we know there's a temptation to ask a different set of questions. There's a temptation, even with good intention, to ask, well, what does this team want the church to look like as we approach our 175th anniversary? Or what do we want the members, or what do the members rather want the church to look like as we move forward? Let's, let's just ask them and just ask them, what should the church be? We could ask all the new residents of Midtown, those mythical unicorn type millennials, and all the retirees that are making a home within proximity of 16th and Peachtree, we can ask them, what do they want the church to be like? But like Peter and the apostles, like Paul Schneider, our congregation must continually ask, what does God want? And then obey it. What does God want? And then do it and be it. We must put God's will first. If Jesus Christ is our leader, we must ask him, rely on him, and trust him to take us where we need to go. He is our Lord, he is our savior, and he is our 
leader. May we continue to follow him for the sake of this congregation's future, for the sake of the gospel, and for the sake of the world. May it be so in us today and the days ahead. And all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. Jesus Christ is the risen Lord, He is Savior, and we have been called to confess Him as leader with our lives and in the life of this church. May we do such a thing. And for the road ahead, may the peace of Christ, which goes beyond all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Him. May His peace live inside of you this day and every day of your life.